Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. Mark chapter 4 and verse number 35. The Bible said, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. They had sent away the multitude. They took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so <coughs> that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. <coughs> and they awake him and said unto, say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? Even the wind and the sea obey. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open. And we're going to look back into these two texts that I read tonight in Mark 4. And then we're going to look into Mark chapter number 5. But as, our, as we walk into Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5, I would say that Mark 5 is one of the greatest preaching chapters of the entirety of the Word of God. You men uh, that are sitting here, that God's called you to preach, you just find some wells in the Scripture. I mean, man, uh, uh, they're just good fishing in those wells. Can I get a witness? Amen. I'm not much of a fisherman. I like catching, and if we're not catching much, I don't like fishing much. Can I get a witness? I I don't go to fish, I go to catch, and we ain't catching, I'm not fishing long, amen. I, I mean, there's just some text in the Bible that are rich. I love the book of Ruth. I'm glad that I didn't have to get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John uh, to find a gospel picture in our Bible. Uh, but there, you look in that gospel picture of Ruth and Boaz and everything that it means. Uh, uh, my heart is encouraged. I think about chapters like Hebrews chapter number 11 that we refer to as the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. One. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then he begins to catalog of some of the greatest Christians to ever don shoe leather. He says now by faith Abel and now by faith Enoch and now by faith Noah and by faith Abraham and by faith Sarah and by faith Isaac and by faith Joseph and by faith Moses. And then he gets him down to the end of that chapter and he said time would fail me uh, that I would mention Gideon and Bayer and he begins to risk some more. And uh, the Lord catalogs some of the greatest Christians uh, uh, that believed God and God counted it to them as righteousness uh, and used their life uh, for the glory of God. I said before, we call that the hall of faith. Uh, I go into some churches and they'll have some pictures of some men of God and, and some saints of God that have made uh, a great difference in the ministry of that church. And I always enjoy walking down the those hallways and looking at those portraits of people that made a difference because of their life of Christ. Uh, I think about uh, Luke chapter 15. Our brother just saying, uh, he let me come home. I tell you, I like the way brother Lance Carpenter said it. He's still sitting in my place uh, at the table. Amen. And if you're here tonight uh, and you've been in the far country, I've got good news. Uh, he won't just let that prodigal come home. He'll let you come home. Amen. Uh, if you'll just jump the rail, hit the trail, praise God. Uh, uh, you'll find that the Lord is looking for you. Uh, everything in he, uh, Luke 15 uh, is lost. You got the lost sheep. Uh, you've got the lost silver. You've got the lost son. Uh, and you've got the lost sibling. Uh, and uh, when you close Luke 15, the only thing that was lost that didn't get in uh, uh, was the sibling. The sheep got in. Uh, uh, the silver got in. And the son got in. Uh, and it was only the sibling that didn't uh, uh, when his dad bid him to come in that he would not go in and you say well what would you call that chapter preacher well I would call that God's lost and found everything in there is lost and just about everything gets found before the chapter closes amen I think about that but when you come to Mark chapter number 5 and what you find is it's not the hall of faith and when you might look at it it's not God's lost and found but when you walk into Mark 
chapter number five, uh, you find yourself in a chapter uh, that I would call the hall of the hopeless. Uh, every situation that's recorded uh, in Mark chapter five is a hopeless, uh, uh, it seems for us looking in, uh, uh, that man, there's nothing that can be done in these situations. Uh, and I would call that the hall of the hopeless. Uh, uh, but can I tell you, if we're not careful, uh, uh, that's what you and I will turn our attention to. Uh, uh, we'll turn our attention to the storms. Uh, uh, we'll turn our attention to the difficulties. Uh, and that's what we find ourselves majoring on. Uh, uh, but I tell you what you'll do if you'll look at the bookends. Uh, I read that first in Mark 4, 35 uh, uh, through verse number 41. Uh, and what you find is there's a storm in that text. Uh, and then you walk over to Mark chapter number 6. Uh, and you'll find another storm uh, in that text. And boy, you've got two bookends uh, of the storms. Uh, and what you do, listen, we sing about it today. We, uh, we sing more about the storm, uh, I'm afraid, than we do the Savior. Uh, uh, we sing more about the difficulty uh, uh, than we do the grace of God. Uh, uh, we sing more about the heartbreaks uh, uh, than we do about the blessings of God. Uh, uh, that's our nature. That's what we're turned to. Uh, uh, but can I say to you, uh, uh, between these two storms, uh, uh, you count the miracle in Mark 4 where he calmed the sea uh, and then you count the three miracles uh, uh, that he does in Mark chapter 5 uh, and then you think about the feeding of the 5,000 uh, in uh, Mark chapter 6. Uh, what you do is you've got two storms uh, and five miracles. Uh, uh, can I say as the songwriter said uh, he's given us more sunshine than he's given rain. He's given us more blessing than he has burden uh, and God help us not to miss uh, uh, the light for the darkness. Amen. Uh, I like the way Brother Rudy said I was driving through Greenville, South Carolina uh, late in the night and I think he preaches uh, at the midnight hour 1230 uh, and I was listening to WTBI as I rolled through uh, and uh, old Brother Rudy Smith was uh, preaching. He said don't doubt in the dark uh, what God showed you in the light. Uh, I'm glad God showed me some things before the storm clouds uh, ever rolled up and before the first uh, a sound of thunder uh, uh, crashed across the skies of my soul uh, and the first strike of lightning I'm glad uh, uh, God has proven himself as she just sang uh, over and over and over again amen I want us by way of introduction just for a minute and uh, then maybe I'll just preach one point but let me say this I want us to notice some differences in Mark 4 the text I read to you and Mark 5. You say, what do you mean? Just stay with me for just a minute. I want you to notice some differences. Look at Mark chapter number 4. Notice what the Lord said to them in verse number 40. Here you've got the disciples. They're in a storm and they think they're going down. And they come to the Lord and they say, carest thou not that we perish? And notice how the Lord rebukes them. He said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Can I say in Mark chapter 4, of the difference between Mark 4 and uh, what's going to happen in Mark 5. In Mark 4, the servants are hopeless. Here they are looking at him and they're saying, Lord, carest thou not that we perish? Uh, have you ever found yourself in a situation uh, maybe like Elijah did? I mean, just four verses uh, after uh, he just did a miracle of God. You close first uh, uh, Kings 18 and he just called down fire out of heaven, praying 63 words uh, and just uh, just slew that whole, uh, that whole lot of the prophet of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal. And man, four verses later... Uh, he got a letter from Jezebel uh, and now he's run away and he said Lord just let me die I'm no better than my father's uh, and what he was is he was hopeless uh, and listen I don't know a lot about a lot of different denominations uh, uh, but as God is my witness about every night of my life uh, I am in church with Baptist people like you and I and can I tell you I'm looking at them on a nightly basis uh, and a weekly basis and I'm preaching to some uh, uh, their counter 
countenance tells me uh, they have no hope. Uh, their countenance tells me they're heartbroken. Uh, their countenance says, uh, their attitude says, and their actions say, uh, a preacher, man, it just it's not going to get any better. And that's what it thought. Can I say when you're in a, uh, uh, when you're in a storm, uh, as long as your boat's in the sea, you're okay. Uh, but when the sea gets in your boat, friend, uh, I mean, that's what it said. The sea was now in their boat, uh, and it was full. Uh, uh, neighbor, that's when you start going down. Amen? Uh, and in that text, the servants were hopeless. Uh, I wonder who I'm preaching to tonight. Uh, you've been praying for a grandchild. Uh, uh, you've been praying for a son. Uh, you've been praying for a daughter. Uh, you've been praying for a spouse. Uh, uh, you've been praying for a friend, uh, a cousin, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, you've been praying for your marriage. Uh, uh, you've been praying for some situation. Uh, and man, it's almost like you just want to throw up your hands uh, and say, Lord, it's just not going to get any better. Uh, but not only as you think about those servants were hopeless, but I think about Mark chapter 5. You walk into Mark 5 and you bump into a demoniac right off the bat. And then the next lady you see in Mark 5, uh, it's the woman with an issue of blood. Uh, and then the third individual you see uh, in Mark 5 is Jairus' little girl. And you say, preacher, what are you saying? Well, I, I mean, here that boy is. Uh, I mean, he comes to the Lord. Uh, he's full of a, a legion of devils. Uh, and man, I mean, man, the town had already kicked him out. Uh, he was living up in the tombs, cutting himself. Uh, uh, society had no answer for him. Uh, I mean, buddy, you looked at him. If you were to find him today, uh, he would be in the local institution uh, or the asylum for people uh, who are mentally unstable. Uh, he would have a zipper and buckles on his coat uh, uh, because they were afraid he was going to hurt somebody else uh, or hurt himself. Uh, and then you look at that little woman with the issue of blood. Uh, I mean, she has spent all she had uh, and she was none the better. Uh, and man, you think good night in the morning. Uh, I mean, buddy, you'd have said, man, there ain't no hope for her. Uh, and if you were to find her today, uh, uh, she would be in the care of a hospice nurse uh, and a hospice doctor. Uh, uh, they would be making her comfortable. Uh, uh, they would be making her where she didn't have any pain uh, uh, to make her last days uh, and her last hours comfortable. And then if you found Jairus' daughter, uh, a neighbor, she wouldn't be in the same asylum uh, and she would not be uh, under palliative care. Uh, uh, but you would find her, you'd find her at the funeral home. Uh, uh, there'd be a casket, uh, uh, there would be a visitation, uh, and we would be passing around, shaking hands, uh, and reminiscing about better days, uh, and trying to comfort the family. Everywhere you look, uh, every one of those situations uh, uh, seem hopeless. It's not the servants that are hopeless, uh, it's the situations that are hopeless. Uh, I mean, man, you look at that boy, he's got devils. Uh, and then you look at that lady, she's got disease. Uh, and then you look at that little girl, and it's death. Uh, and they nobody can handle devils and there's nobody that can handle disease and there's nobody that can handle death like the son of God but aren't you glad thank God in the situations in Mark 5 to you and I they're hopeless until the Lord decided to involve himself in every one of those situations there's the contrast of the problems but then there's the contrast of the position. Notice verse 24 in Mark chapter 5. The Bible said, Jesus went with him, speaking of Jairus, and much people followed him and thronged him. And then, verse number 27, when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind, touched his garment, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? There is a contrast in position from verse number 24 to verse number 30. You say, what's the difference? Well, in verse number 24, there were people who thronged him. 
Can I tell you where most Christians are satisfied to be? They're satisfied to be in the zip code of Christ. They're satisfied to be in the area code of Christ. They're satisfied to be in the group that names the name of Christ. They're satisfied to be in the crowd that is following him around. I mean, they're satisfied just to be in earshot. or They're satisfied just to be in sight. And they're satisfied just to be among the people who are numbered to be followers uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, They don't want to get any closer uh, uh, because of the commitment that it requires. uh, uh, Because of the sacrifice that it requires. uh, uh, But can I tell you, God, help me. uh, I do not want to settle for just throng in the Son of God. Amen. Are you listening tonight? Come preacher, come help me. You come be the Lord. You come be the Lord. He likes that, didn't he? I told Miss Amy, I said, Mama, the Bible said Sarah called Abraham Lord. She said, you ain't Abraham, praise God. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Y'all come help me, boys. Y'all come throng him. Just get around him. Get around him. Come right over here. Amen. Come right here, my man. They're thronging him. They're around him. They can hear him. But they go home the same way they came. How many times you come to church, you hear the preaching, you hear the singing, you hear the testimonies, and you go home the way you came? You come just that you you leave the way you came in and you're like that week after week after week after week and you feel good about it because you were here. You feel good about it because the preacher's not going to call you on Monday and see where you were. Uh, but see, you're just in the crowd that's throng in him. Are you listening to me? Are, are you satisfied with just thronging him? Are you? I never one time when I played ball did I ever run the heels in baseball, work out all summer, two a days in practice in August when it was before there was a heat index. You know, they don't let them practice because it's hot now. Dear Lord, the car coach didn't think we were practicing until our guts were hanging out of our mouth. Concussion protocol. We call that our getting our bell rung. And if you could walk back out there, you were good to play. Amen. I got hit so hard one night I ran to the wrong sideline. Hello. That coach turned me around, patted me on the backside, and sent me to my sideline. Are you listening to me? I mean, I never one time did any of that during the week and during the summer to watch somebody else play when the horn sounded or the whistle blew or the umpire said play ball. I wanted the game, friend. Are you listening to me? Amen. Amen. You didn't have to pump me. When I was a sophomore and a freshman at football practice, you know you're about to get your head knocked off when you go out there. Them guys outweigh you by 50 pounds. They're stronger than you are. They're, they're, They're faster than you are. But man, you didn't have to beg me to get out there. I wanted out there because I knew when they got ready to put somebody in, it wasn't going to be somebody they had to beg to play. I, have you ever got out of the have you ever got out of the situation where all you want to do is throng him? But that Bible said that that little woman came in the press behind him right. and she had an issue of blood 12 years. She had spent all she had and she was none the better. And if you study the things that they would have done to her, the, the, the crudeness of medicine of that day, it's amazing. She survived the treatments they tried to put on her. But let me ask you a question. Do you think a little, you, you, I'm glad you're sitting by your wife this year. I got in trouble last year. Yeah, I praise God, man. I thought I'm staying away from that front pew. I got in trouble in December. Amen. I'm glad. <laughs> Hallelujah. I thought you was going to stop me before I got to the hotel last year. Amen. You think that little, these strong boys, they're pretty skinny, but they'll grow. They'll swell eventually. <laughs> they get a wife that can cook and their, and, their, and their metabolism dies like ours has. They'll start to swell. Somebody asked me the other day, said, Preacher, you still growing? I said, nope, just swelling. Amen. <laughs> you think she could have mixed it up up here with them to get in there to where he was? Nope. I don't think so. The Bible said she touched the hem of his garment. 
See, I think she got down there where there was no competition. She couldn't battle them up there. They would have pushed her around and knocked her down. But she got down there where there was no competition. She got down to where she was, got between their legs, reached up and got the hem of his garment, which would have had that ribbon of blue. Uh, speaking about heaven right there, friend, uh, I'm telling you, there was a crowd around him. But there wasn't but one lady that used to sing back in the 80s. She pressed through the crowd, uh, reached out and touched Jesus, friend. Uh, and that was the only individual that left out of that uh, uh, left out of that encounter with Christ uh, whose life had been changed uh, and it was not because she thronged her it was not because she was just near him uh, but she made her mind up uh, or that she was going to come in the press behind him and touch the son of God I wonder who of us tonight need to change positions thank you man preacher you stay with me Thank you, fellas. There's a contrast in position. But then, let me suggest to you, there is a contrast in priorities. Notice verse 23, Jairus is, Jairus is doing everything he can to convince the Lord Jesus to go to his house and touch his daughter. He said, Lord, if you'll just come, she shall be healed. I mean, you're talking about faithful words. I mean, this is the ruler of the synagogue. He, he could lose his well-being. He would have been over, the overseer of the, the events that went on in the temple, the temple. And man, he was a man of influence. But you know what he figured out? He figured out that dead law couldn't do anything for his dead daughter. Right. So what he decided to do was leave the dead law at the temple and go find a living Savior yeah. who could make a difference in his daughter. Yeah. Right. Now, we're King James men, aren't we? So we believe the Word of God's inspired, do we not? Well, if that's true, for the Word of God to be inspired, that means the words of God. The words. Notice closely the words of verse 24. Does your Bible not say this? And he went with him. He, speaking of Jesus, went with him. Now, I believe, preacher, you can correct me, but I believe what that indicates to me is when they left this time, Jairus was leading. Mm. Lord, you, I'm going with you. And Jairus is taking me mm -hmm. to his house. Right. He's, he's, Jairus, he said, come on, Lord, we got to go. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we get to go and somebody reaches through there and touches the hem of his garment and all of a sudden the Lord stops in his tracks turns around in this great crowd and said who touched my clothes can I tell you every bit of hope that had sprung up in Jairus' heart when the Lord agreed to go to his house as quickly as that hope had sprang up in his heart the moment the Son of God stopped the moment the Son of God turned his attention uh, to another issue that hope that was in Jairus I believe it left you say well he didn't stop long I don't care if he was stopped five minutes to Jairus it felt like five hours and I believe Jairus just went over there, probably sat on the curb and waited till the Lord got done. But for Jairus, it was about to get worse. Because they came to him, is it verse, is it, let me see that Schofield right there. It's in verse number, it's in, it says right, let's see here. He said in verse 35, they came to him. He said, but why thy daughter's dead? Verse 35. Why troublest the master any further? I mean, man, he was afraid it was going to get bad. But now he knows it's got bad. They come to him and say, man, your daughter's gone. She's dead. Why troublest thou the master anymore? And hope was gone. And if you'll study these next, these next verses, there's three times the Lord makes a statement to Jairus. And the first one, he walks over to him and says, be not afraid, only believe. Now look at verse 37. Verse 37 says, and he suffered no man to follow him except Peter James. Is that right? All right, now, 
help me now they're leaving this time mm -hmm. and I believe according to verse 37 the lead dogs changed yeah. when they left in 424 Jairus was doing the lead but when they leave this time the Lord said hey be not afraid, only believe. Hey, Peter, James, and John, y'all call them, come with me. The rest of you stay here. And I believe he took Jairus by the hand. And when they left the second time, I believe the Son of God was in the lead. You know what I find to be wonderful? I don't find one place in there where he asked anybody where Jairus lived. I don't find any direction in there where somebody said, hey, we live over on the east side of town, in the third apartment house, on the fourth floor. No, friend, the Son of God left. Never ask anybody where she was. Never ask anybody where he lived. And he showed up at Jairus' house. I'm telling you, thank God friend, Jairus got his priorities right. But when he left the first time, Jairus was leading. But when they left the second time, the Son of God was leading. And may I say when the Son of God's in the lead in our lives, we don't have to give him counsel. We don't have to tell him what our need is. But we don't have to tell him where our need is or who our need is. He knows the end from the beginning. Amen. 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 Thank you, preacher. A contrast in problems. A contrast in position. A contrast in priorities. Who was in the lead when you got here tonight? Did you bring him to the church or did he bring you to church? I, I hope ain't nobody got the Lord's my co-pilot tag out there. Because I'm about to hurt your feelings. The Lord ain't been cold nothing. He's the Lord. If, if, if he's your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. Hello. Amen. A contrast in problems. A contrast in priorities. A contrast in position. But then I want you to notice the contrast in people. Notice Mark 5. Mark 5. Notice, you know, Mark 5 is long before, you know, we had these all-star preachers that got a, almost like a press corps that goes in front of them. And they go in there and, you know, get everything organized for he comes to town and has a meeting. You know, when the Lord just shows up and for some reason the demon-possessed man that's been kicked out of town, that's living in the tombs, is at the dock and it's, the Bible said immediately. Y'all yeah, right. okay? Yeah. Don't get upset at me now. You, you, let me ask you this. What do you think brought him out of the... What do you think brought him out? Yeah. Yeah. Right. See, you don't have to believe this. This is not going to hurt my feelings. But I believe what went on in Mark 4 had nothing to do with the disciples. I think what happened in Mark 4, 35 through 41 had to do with the demoniac. Because yeah. I believe, you, you, you go over to the Holy Land, those, 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 those cemeteries are in the hillsides. In the hillsides. I wonder if the old boy was up there on the hill cutting himself. His shackles were loosed. And all of a sudden out there on that sea, he could see a storm. Dark clouds lightning he could hear the thunder in the distance and, and all of a sudden a man walks up on the front of the boat maybe puts his hands in the air and all of a sudden the clouds break the sun the sun begins to shine the rain quits falling the waves quit blowing and can you imagine that old demoniac that's been tortured by that legion of devils he said man I don't know what to happen that I just saw but whoever that man was that walked out into the front of that boat and all of a sudden the clouds broke and the sun shone through I don't know who he is but if he can do that to a storm I wonder what he could do to me and I believe what he saw on that mountain is what brought Brought him to the dock. Notice what your Bible said. Verse 6. Jesus, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Notice, notice Mark 5. Notice Mark 5 and verse 39. Speaking of the Lord, it said, And when he was coming in, now there's a difference in people. 
The first few verses of Mark 5, the demoniacs coming to him. In the last verses of Mark 5, he's going to her. Amen. So can I say whether you're coming to him or he's coming to you, when y'all get together, business is about to pick up. Hey, Amen. Hey. Are you listening to me? There's a contrast. I mean, man, there's a difference in people, a difference in uh, a difference in position, a difference in priorities, and a difference uh, uh, in the problem. And those differences, we see what's different. But there's one thing that every one of these situations have in common, and only one. Notice your Bible. Notice verse 38. And he, Mark 4, 38. And he was, help me. What's the next word? And he was in the hinder part of the ship. Mark 5, 1. And they came over onto the other side of the sea. What's the next word? Into the country of the Gadarenes. Notice verse 27 of Mark 5. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press. Notice verse 39. And when he was come, notice verse 40. That is said when they laughed him into scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entereth in. Every one of these situations are different. Some public, some private. Some grand scale, some just small scale. Every one. Some dealing with devils, some dealing with death, some dealing with disaster, some dealing with disease. Every one of these situations is different. If we went through this, every situation on every pew would be different. There would be different names, different degrees, different problems, some financial, some family, some health, some mental, some physical, some spiritual, some, some natural. It would be different. Young people facing things older ones aren't. Older ones facing things that younger ones aren't. Leaders facing things that, uh, that followers don't face. And followers facing some things that maybe the leaders don't face. Every one of them are different. But when you look at the one thing that's the same, we're not seeing what's different, but we're seeing what's divine. And I could preach on all of them, and I'm just going to preach the first point. And I want to preach on this thought for just a few minutes. He's in the middle of it all. He's in the middle of it all. If it's a mom and dad and you're battling financial issues, he's in the middle of it. Young person, you're trying to find the will of God. You're trying to live clean. You're trying to live unspotted from the world. He's in the middle of it all. Amen. If you're a senior trying to finish well or you're a young person trying to get started well, uh, can I tell you, he's in the middle of it all. If you're a pastor, he's in the middle. If you're a deacon, he's in the middle. If you're a church member, he's in the middle. If you're a dad or you're a wife or you're a child or you're an employee, or a friend or a brother, whatever situation you find yourself in, he's in the middle of it all. Amen. And that, in that storm in Mark 4, he's in the middle of the calm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, the, in, in Mark 5 of the demoniac, he's in the middle of the country. Yeah. With that little woman with the issue of blood, he's in the middle of the crowd. Yeah. And then with that little girl that's dead, he's in the middle of the chamber. Yeah. Can I give you three reasons that they might not, that they probably shouldn't have been tore up in that Mark 4 storm that I read to you. I mean, notice what your Bible starts out at. And the same day, what's he talking about? That same day, he had been teaching them the parables of the kingdom. He had been teaching them the word of God. And now the Lord, what does the Bible say? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what the Lord was about to do was to put their faith to the test. And understand this, a faith that cannot be tried is a faith that cannot be trusted. And he's going to put us, I mean, listen, faith is more than a repetition of a creed or a repetition of a doctrinal statement uh, oh, but faith is of what you are willing to lace up uh, in the shoe leather on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and live when it comes to your Christian life Amen. and he's about to put them 
to the test. And what he's about to show him is that he can be trusted in the storms of life. Let me give you three reasons. Look at your Bible. They're right here. Of why he's in the middle and why they shouldn't have been tore up. Number one, look at verse 35. You got a red letter edition. There's some red letter words in there. He said, let us pass over until the other side. You say, preacher, why, what does that have to do with whether or not they should be troubled? Well, number one, they had his promise. Yeah. Maybe I read that wrong. He said, let us now go halfway out into the Sea of Galilee and drown. No all right, boys, get in the boat and let us go almost all the way over there and there's going to be a hole in the boat and we're going to sink. Or boys, get in and uh, man, we're going to float in on some boards. Or did he say, get in the boat and let us pass to the other side. Right. Let me tell you something, friends. Some of us think the only time we get in storms is when we're out of the will of God. Neither time. They were in the boat at his behest. And in Mark 6, he was, they were in the boat at his behest. Both times they got in the storm. Sometimes right smack dab in the middle of the will of God, you're going to find opposition. Right. But you know what a gracious Lord we have? He got in the boat with them in Mark 4. In Mark 6, he put them in the boat, sent them across, and he went up, he, he departed to pray. What about a God that was so gracious that before he put them in a storm by their self, he was in the storm with them first? Yes, good. Right. Good. Amen. Let me just be honest with you. I, I, I'm, I'm wound tight. I mean, I am. I, I, I like you ain't got to beg me to get in a meeting. I come looking to get in the meeting. Right. You're not going to have to, you know, I told, I te teased our folks at home. I said, we're going to start a new ushering ministry. Now, at home, we live in the country, and, and, and I, I, I would say y'all understand this too. How many of y'all got like a steel weed eater or a Hus Varner weed eater, or Hus Varner blower? Y'all got them? Yeah. Amen. Now, if you preach in Atlanta, they have no idea what you're talking about. You got to talk to them about plugging their car up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Or calling an Uber. I thought she was cussing. I thought my wife was cussing the first time she said something about Uber. I, what are you talking about? <laughs> I told them. I teased them at church. I said, what we're going to do, we're going to get some of them little bubbles. They're on them blowers, them Husqvarna blowers and Husqvarna weed eaters. And I'm going to have them. I'm going to have them installed in our church members' necks. And, and when they get there on Sunday morning, they're going to stop by the ushers. And the ushers are going to hit them five times. Yeah. Get them primed. That way they don't wait till nursery, you know, not wait till the invitation to, to engage in the service. I, listen, you ain't gotta you ain't gotta convince me, you've not gotta coax me. If I'm coming to church, I am looking to get in. I want to praise the Lord, I want to go to the altar, I'll testify, I want to sing, I want to shout, I want to cry, I want to give, I want to be engaged in this thing. Amen. 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 I, I I like I mean man I I like I like it high. Yeah, me too. I mean I, I'm wired that way. I'm emotional. I'm not easily offended, but I'm emotional. Right. Miss Amy, when my boys were playing ball, I refereed high school basketball for 15 years, in college and high school baseball for years, and and and, and officials don't make good fans. And I did it, and I, I worked hard to be good. And when our boys were playing, I'd get a little upset. Yeah. And I would voice my displeasure to the officials. Yeah. And Miss Amy would be hitting me on the, she'd say, Daddy, shh, yeah. they're going to hear you. Yeah. I'd say, Mama, I intend for them to hear me. Right. Yeah. And I intend for them to know that I know they're doing it wrong. Y'all yeah. yeah. all right? Y'all pray for me if that offends you. Y'all pray for me. I mean, man, I... I, listen, if it's the Lord, I'm giving it everything I got. If it's ball, we're playing ball. If you want to race to the car, I'll probably push you down and cheat. I want to win. I mean, amen. Amen. If Miss Amy's beating me on words with friends and we're playing while I'm gone, I mean, all of a sudden, hey, mom, my phone died. I'm not losing, praise God. I'm sorry my phone battery's dead. But I've had to learn I can't operate in the realm of feeling. 
There's some that our feeling is our most shallow part of our person. And man, if that's all I had was how I felt, there'd be some mornings I wouldn't feel saved. There would be some mornings I didn't feel like a preacher. There'd be some mornings I didn't even feel like a Christian. Yeah. Amen. And fear would take over and depression would take over if I operated in that. But can I tell you, thank God, when I can't find him, when I can't feel it, I've got a Bible that I can open and lay on my desk. And whether I feel it or whether I don't feel it does not affect that what I'm laying my eyes on and what I'm trusting. It's not a feeling. It's fact. It's the Word of God. And may I say to you, His commandments are His enablements. When He commands you to do something. He will enable you uh, to fulfill his command. Uh, they shouldn't have been tore up because they had his promise. Right. Good. Good. They shouldn't have been tore up because they had his presence. Yeah. Right. Is it verse 38? That said he was in the hinder part of the ship. Is that 38? He, he was in there with them. Did they really think they were going to drown with the man who spoke the sea into existence. I mean, how many of y'all I used to when I said white headed folks, I was talking to other people, now I'm talking to myself. I've got me an old preacher car. Now I bought my wife's aunt's two thousand nine Cadillac DTS. My 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 youngest said to me, he said, Daddy, you are officially an old preacher. So he told me, I said, Thank you, son, I appreciate the encouragement. I said, but I've been old for a while. Have you not noticed the snow on top of my head? He said, Daddy, when you pull up, they're going to think a whole different man came. Instead of you driving your big truck, I said, I am going to be a different man. I'm going to have a hundred extra dollars in my pocket. I'm not putting that fuel in that big truck. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Amen. He said he was in the hinder part of you. Some of you older ones would remember them singing, one night upon the sea, a ship was tossing to and fro. Breakers dashed on every hand, angry billows round me roll. But then they got to that song, it talked about the master of the sea. Did they really think they were going to perish with the master of the sea on the boat? I've always thought it's a neat thing in that text that he rebuked the wind and he spoke peace to the sea. Prince of the power of the air. Yeah. He rebuked the air. Yeah. Spoke peace to the sea. Yeah. Just a little thought. Yeah, good, good. You can think about that at Waffle House with Brother Dean over a bowl of chili. I don't go to Waffle House. I don't go to if I go to Waffle House with Brother Dean at twelve o'clock, it's not to eat chili because he doesn't have acid reflux and I do. <laughs> Amen. I'll go talk with him. Not in one of them booths. They're not made for grown men. Amen. <laughs> they had his presence. Don't we believe that he dwells within us? You said, well, I can't feel him. Well, I got good news. You said, preacher, it's dark. I got good news. The Bible said he dwelleth in the thick darkness. So whether you feel it or whether you can find him, according to that Bible, he lives in the believer. So if we're in it, he's in it. We're not by, by ourselves. Number three, and I'm done. Come on back to the piano, son. They had his promise. They had his presence. But then they had his peace. And he was in the hinder part of the ship fretting. He was in the hinder part of the ship biting his fingernails. He was in the hinder part of the ship taking the sip to calm his nerves. Now if he was a recovering fundamentalist, he might do be, you know, <laughs> taking a sip. Y'all all right? But the Lord wasn't taking a sip to calm his nerves. That Bible said he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep. You know what the biggest thing they shouldn't have been tore up was? Because he wasn't tore up. He wasn't. He wasn't fretting. He wasn't fearful. He wasn't lightening the ship. He wasn't looking to jump off the boat in the middle of, of the storm that they thought they were going to die in, he was resting. And could you and I not? See, they had his promise. 
They had his presence. And then they had his peace. Yeah, yeah. good. Amen. I'll never forget. I was at George George Tech football game. I was about 12 years old, 11 years old. That's a pretty good size, 11 year old. And my dad and I, we were going to the bathroom. We were going to the bathroom. And these two drunks got to fighting. And they knocked me away from my dad. And I was in between these men. And I was big enough, if even at 11 or 12, if that one man would have hit that other man, he would have hit me. I was scared to death. I mean, I, I was standing there, and man, these folks all around us, and my dad's an ex-MP in the military. He's a man's man. And, and I was standing there between them two men, and I thought, man, I'm about to get my block knocked off. And I'm fretting. And all of a sudden, I looked at my dad, and my dad reached across that thing. Now, don't judge my daddy. But he reached across that man, he put his hand on that man's shoulder. He said, sir, if you hit that boy, he said, I'll kill you. All of a sudden, I wasn't scared no more. Matter of fact, I thought, hit me. I might have just perked my chin up because I really wanted to see my daddy wax that floor with that man. That man had scared me to death. I thought he was going to hurt me. And all of a sudden, when daddy reached over that gate and put his hand on that man, I thought, man, business is about to pick up. I'm not scared anymore. You know why? Because I'd heard my daddy. I'd saw my daddy. And let me just say, there was no quiver in his voice. There was no joking. And I mean, I should have kicked the man just to see if what he would do. Just, I mean, amen. I mean, y'all pray for me. I wouldn't save them. But you know what made me at peace? I'd seen my dad. I'd seen him. How long has it been since you seen him? You said, preacher, I can't see him. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, yes. You lay that book over on your study, yeah. on your desk, or you, you put that book on the, on the audio while you drive to work and just listen to it. Yeah. If you read this book like it's a math book, you're going to find some math facts, yeah. but you're going to miss the purpose of reading your Bible. Right. If you read it like a science book, you're going to find some scientific fact, and you're going to find that it is scientifically accurate. But you're going to miss the purpose of this book. Right. If, you read it, if you read it like a biology book, you're going you're gonna to find biology in it, the plants and the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. You're going to find things like that. But if you read it like that, if you, you read it like a history book, it contains much history. But if that's the way you read it, you're going to miss the purpose of reading. The purpose of reading this book is finding him. Yeah. I'll never forget, I was, Michelle and I had gone to, we were keeping the daughter before our boys were born. She's probably, the little girl was about a little older than this one. And she was sitting in the back, I'd gone to pick her up and we were keeping her for the weekend for her parents. And, and I had, my, my preaching Bible was in the back of my car and I heard her get it and I heard the pages turning and I thought, you know, the preachers are a little bit particular about our preaching Bible. And, and she weren't, you, you tell she wasn't doing it hard, so I let her. And all of a sudden she said, there he is. And I said, Kaylin, there who is? She said, there he is. I said, who? She said, Jesus. And what she had been doing, I've got one of those little, I've got that by mine, like her little Bible she had, but she had mine. I've got that little blue children's Bible that's in my hope chest that had the pictures all the way through it. And she was flipping through my Bible to see if there was pictures in there. And I don't know what she, she I didn't have no pictures in there. But she got to a page and she said, there he is. There he is. Can I tell you, it's been that real some mornings that I've sat down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And man, I couldn't feel him. And man, I was the storm was in the boat and the winds were around me. And I got in that book and started flipping the page. And it's almost like I could say, there he is. There he is. That's who I've been looking for. There he is. I remember reading some years ago, an ocean liner, a passenger vessel from England to New York City. Back before these, these ships of this modern day are so big. They got in a bad storm, and man, it, it really looked bad for the pastors like they would 
possibly that ship was going to go down. So a large group of people were traveling together, so they got them all together in one of the cabins. And they elected a representative to go to the bridge to talk to the captain to see if it was going to be all right. So the, the man they elected made his way up to the bridge. He knocked on the door, stepped in, closed, slipped out quietly, closed the door, walked back to the room. He got back and they said, what did he say? He said, didn't say anything. They said, well, did you ask him a question? What did you ask him? He said, didn't ask him anything. Well, we sent you to ask him, so what did you do? He said, we stepped in. The, he said, I knocked on the door. And I stepped into the bridge. And across the bridge, I saw the face of the captain. And said, so when I saw his face, I just stepped out, quietly shut the door behind me. Because when I saw his face, I knew everything was going to be all right. You're on the boat with sailors. When sailors get nervous, you probably ought to get nervous. But when you see the captain and he's in control, that's what they had. They had his word. Let us pass over to the other side. They, they had his presence. He was in the boat with them. And they had his peace. He's in the middle of it all. Don't know what you brought. Don't know what storm you brought. Don't know what impossible situation you may have found yourself in. But I've got good news. He was in the middle of the calm. He was in the middle of the country. He was in the middle of the crowd. And he was in the middle of the chamber. And in every situation, he came through. I'm, I, I'm not as far along as some of you. But I'm not the kid preacher anymore. I, I sort of hate that. I used to like it when they said, let all the young preachers stand up. Boy, I want to jump up. But now the fact that I can't jump up as quick reminds me I'm not the young preacher anymore. But I tell you this, I believe I can stand here in front of you to say, as the songwriter, some have sang in the last few years, I've been through enough to know that he'll be enough for you and he'll be enough for me. And maybe, maybe you came tonight and you were in the lead. Might be better to leave with him in the lead. Yeah, good. You might have come satisfied and settled just to be in the throng. But it might be that your life's never changed like it could have because you were settled to throng him and you never pressed through the crowd to touch him. You might have been waiting on him to come to you. You might want to come to him. Amen. You say, what you going to find? Well, every one of those situations are different, except for one thing. He was in the middle of it all. We're going to stand. Our brother's going to play. I wonder how many of us might slip around an altar and say, Lord, I, 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 I just need your word on it. I need your word on it. Lord, I need your peace. I, Lord, I need your presence. Lord, I, I've been in the wrong position in my life. I've been trying to lead you when I realize tonight you need to be leading me. Lord, I thought I needed to counsel you to where I needed you to go and what I needed you to do, but what I found out is when you got in the lead, you knew exactly where to go. You knew exactly how to meet the need. He's in the middle. He's in the middle. In, in the hinder part of the ship, into the country, in the press behind, and he entereth in. What about you? I don't know what, I, I tell you this, none of us know what we're going to find in the storm. But if you're a child of God, you can know who you're going to find in the storm. He's not going to leave you to yourself. He's in the middle of it all. 
Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.